Hi, welcome to the All Things LGBTQ interview show, where we interview LGBTQ guests who are making important contributions to our communities. All Things LGBTQ is taped at Orca Media in Montpelier, Vermont, which we recognize as being unceded indigenous land. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. Hi, everybody. I'm here with Bettina Apfiker, and it's my great honor to welcome her to the show. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Anne. I really appreciate it. I think it'll be fun. I do, let's, too. Let's, We're all let's, smiling. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, let's start with a brief bio. Uh, for those of you who don't know Bettina and her work, hard to believe, but Bettina Epfiker is a distinguished professor emerita of feminist studies at the University of California, Santa Cruz, where she taught for more than 40 years. An activist scholar, she co-led the free speech movement at UC Berkeley in 1964 and the National Student Mobilization Committee to end the war in Vietnam. She played a leading role in the international movement to free Angela Davis, and you've written several books about it and co-edited, co-authored some. Uh, she's been part of the LGBT movement since the late 70s. She has published several books, <clears throat> including a memoir, Intimate Politics, How I Grew Up Red, Fought for Free Speech, and Became a Feminist Rebel. I love that title. Her most recent book, and one reason we're here to celebrate is called Communists in the Closet, Queering the History. She and her wife, Kate Miller, have been together since 1979. They live in Santa Cruz. So welcome again, Bettina. It's really delightful that you're, you've agreed to join us. We'll put a Thank shot you. of book cover. I have many questions. And so let's get down to it, if that is okay with you. It's fine, thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, you worked on this book for 10 years. Very impressive. Uh, can you tell us how you managed that? What was your process? <clears throat> I was, um, <clears throat> I fell into this subject a, a little serendipitously because of a generous in, um, invitation from Aaron Lechleiter who's a colleague in, in Boston, who recently published a book called Love's Next Meeting, which has some similar themes to mine. It's a little bit, it's quite different and broader. But but he uh, he got me started on this and I and I started talking to people about it and I did a presentation and and uh, at NYU when I was there as a visiting professor in 2010. And uh, my huge crowd turned out <clears throat> for this. And they all seem to be uh, either ex-communists or ex-socialists or or still communist, you know, whatever. And many of them were queer, and they they had so much to say uh, in response to my little presentation that I ended up mostly just taking notes and listening to them. And as a result of that, um, a lot of them came up to me afterwards and said, "You've got to write a book. You need to write a book about this." And because uh, I hadn't thought of that. I just thought of this as a paper that I was, you know, like that. So uh, I discovered that the Communist Party archives were in the Tamament Library, which is at NYU. And I started research in there. The, the, the problem in all of the archives, including the Communist Party archive, is there's no category if, if you're a left, if, if you're in a left archive, or something like that. There's no category for lesbian or gay or homosexuality or anything like that. So you have to know people to look up or organizations to look up, or you have to have some kind of lead, you know, that gets you into it. My big problem with, so that's why it took so long. The point is that's why it took so long in the archives. And when I was, I was in the communist party archives, I was also in the archives of Smith college um, because there were specific individuals who I knew were, were communist and queer, uh, likewise in the Schlesinger Library at Radcliffe and, and so on. And I was in the one archive in Los Angeles um, and uh, the San Francisco Public Library has most of Harry Hayes papers. The New York Public Library has a lot of papers. 
So it takes a long time uh, because I was teaching full time also. So that's why it took 10 years. But, I, but once I got started on it, I was just fascinated by it. And and one one person would lead me to another, would lead me to another and so on. And so it became a, a passion, <laughs> a passion to pursue as much as I could. Well, and you include your personal experience with some of these people. Yes, and yes. In the, in the book, <clears throat> when you were starting out after you gave the talk at the panel, you expressed concern about all the archives, if I am not mistaken. And your partner, Kate, said, you yourself are the archive. <laughs> so, you know, your personal experience adds a lot, I think, to uh, to the study. It was very helpful, first of all, because I was in the Communist Party for about 19 years in my youth. Um, I left in 1981. And uh, just, to, just so people understand, the Communist Party banned gays and lesbians from membership for 60 years, from 1938 to um, uh, 1991. And uh, so in that span of time, I knew that I couldn't have been the only lesbian. I mean, that's just logical. <clears throat> and I also knew how the party operated and I knew who people were. And, um, and so that lent uh, a certain um, uh, helpfulness to me in terms of who to look at. And I had suspicions about people. My father occasionally uh, would mention somebody to me and tell me to look them up. How he knew they were gay or lesbian, don't ask me, I don't know. But that was what happened. And once I found one person, then I could see, well, who they corresponded with, right? And the kind of letters that they wrote, and then that would lead to somebody else and so on. So it, it took a long time, but I was very I was very persistent about it because I knew that this was a history worth finding. And didn't your mother connect you with Lillian Wald? I mean, they had both been in the party so long that they had a lot of... Um... Well, my, my mother's story is, is very funny. It was, was so when I came out to my mother, <clears throat> finally, because I was very nervous about coming out to her, uh, she told me that uh, uh, about Lillian Wald, you know, she was trying to be helpful and she was trying to say people that she had known in her in her life, you know, who were who were lesbians. And that's why she did it. And and I asked her how she knew about Lillian Wald, who was not in the Communist Party. But Lillian Wald, for those who don't know, was the founder of the Henry Street Settlement in the Lower East Side in New York. And uh, and she was a lesbian. And the way I knew she was a lesbian was because I had read an essay by Blanche Wiesen Cook, the, the scholar Blanche Wiesen Cook, who had written about her very recently. So I said to my mother, well, how do you know? How, and this is in the book, you know, but I said, how do you, how do you know Lillian Wolf? And she she just looked at me and scoffed and she said, the whole neighborhood knew. <laughs> so so that's at one point I say so much for historians in our archives, right? Because if you talk to people, I mean, this actually was significant because in, in terms of, for example, Lorraine Hansberry also, uh, the, 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 the archive that contained all of her lesbian writings and, and reflections on being uh, gay uh, were sealed for 50 years by, you know, by her, uh, by Bob Nemiroff, who was her husband and, or at that point, her ex-husband, but her executor. And, um, and so because they were sealed, uh, people went and just talked to people in the in the village. They just went out and talked to people in the village. And Barbara Greer also sort of broke the lid on that um, before. So before the 50 years were up, people knew and so on. But I was fortunate in my timing in that by the time I started writing about Lillian, uh, Lorraine Hansberry in my book, the files were open. Well, and you know, I was went to college at Barnard between 69 and 73. And I saw, speaking of Lorraine Hansberry, I saw the last performance of To Be Young, Gifted, and Black. Mm -hmm. And I didn't come out till 75 after I left New York. But I thought, um, I just felt that she was a lesbian, but Robert Nemiroff, Nemir Nemiroff was her husband. So I thought, well, she couldn't be a lesbian. I was sort of wondering about myself. So that leads me to um, a question about the lesbian sensibility. When you write about in the chapter, especially about Betty Millard, uh, you mention a lesbian sensibility and uh, you mention it at various points. Would you mind describing it? 
because I'm so interested in that idea. Sure. So I talk about that. So for people, again, just a brief thing about Betty Millard, just to put her in context. Uh, she was this marvelous um, uh, communist uh, for many years. And um, she was a member of an organization called um, Congress of American Women, which is an early formation uh, during the time of the Popular Front in the in the in the forties, uh, in the Popular Front against fascism, and it was a, a, a an organization which many communists were involved, although it was a mu it was much broader than the Communist Party, and um, so uh, she also was an editor, uh, an assistant editor at the New Masses, which was the cultural publication of the Communist Party. And um, that put her right in the center of, of so much communist politics and things that were happening and so on. So while she was at, um, there's, there's two things to say. While she was at the Congress of American Women, she was uh, elected as a delegate to the Women's International Democratic Federation which was an international organization that was set up at the end of directly at the end of World War II um, by women, many of them communists, many of them from the socialist countries at that time, and many of them not, who, who were resistance fighters during World War II. And um, so she was a delegate to the WIDF, the Women's International Democratic Federation. And as the editor uh, at New Masses, she ended up writing a pamphlet or a 24 page pamphlet that was called woman as myth and it's a and i detail it in that chapter because it's quite extraordinary and it's really it's it's the first effort toward a marxist feminist analysis of women's oppression and it was very feminist and um very original in its thinking and it, it and it was published in two parts in new masses and then they published it as a pamphlet and uh, the Congress of American Women sort of scooped it up and people were reading it and talking about it and so on. And I write at some point in there that although she was very closeted and Betty was closeted almost her whole life until nearly the very end of her life. And thank goodness she lived long enough not to be in the closet, but that's another story. But at, at that point, she was very closeted, but I say she had a lesbian, I, I felt a lesbian sensibility in that First, because of her love for women, not, not sexualized, but the feeling of it, and her um, devotion to the idea of women's oppression and um, women's subordination and the way she wrote about it led me to, to think, and also because it, that's, see, women's subordination was contrary in many ways to her own experience as a lesbian, she was an independent woman. So that's what I meant by, uh, th there's a certain consciousness in there. That's what I meant by a lesbian sensibility that you could, that I felt as I was, as I was reading Woman as Myth, even though, of course, I already knew she was a lesbian, but it's a very powerful, it's a very powerful work. And as I say, I detail it, I detail the chapters of it in my book so that, because I assume that people don't know about it. So I yeah. think this, this uh, I just want to say this lesbian sensibility, I think, Sometimes it's also in the art. Uh, there was an artist that I talk about in the book very briefly, whom I don't know. Was, I don't even know if she was in the Communist Party. I just say that. I don't know. And I don't know if she was a lesbian. I don't know that. But there's a sensibility about the power of her drawings of the women and the way she presents them in a certain kind of solidarity with each other rather than as victims, you know, or passive that led me to, so I would say that also, like that's a, let to me, that's a lesbian sensibility. And in the introduction, you identify a concrete feature with yourself in that a lesbian sensibility makes you notice heterosexuality. That's right. Know? Yeah, I notice it. <laughs> I notice <laughs> it when I notice it when I meet people. And it doesn't, it, it doesn't make me uh, prejudiced or something. It just, it's just something I notice. Whereas I think many heterosexual people don't particularly notice it because it's the norm. Mm -hmm. So what they notice is if you're very flamboyant as gay, they, right? You know, a straight person uh -huh. knows that. Mm -hmm. But even, even if you're not, you know, I learned this when I was teaching, Anne. You know, if I didn't come out to my students, 
very early in the class, they just assumed I was straight, right? Because mm -hmm. I don't, you know, I'm just dressed and, you know, I didn't, I didn't wear some, I just didn't, you know, it's not my personality. So I'm not criticizing anybody. I just didn't do that. But they would, they would see me <laughs> and they would, they would think I was, I was straight. And, and so I had to be very open with them very early when I finally was comfortable with being out. So earlier and earlier in the quarter, I would, I would come out <laughs> until it was the first day, you know, and then make sure that they knew. I remember coming out to one student in the, I, in one class and one of the students' eyes just <laughs> I, <laughs> expressing shock like, and surprise. It's like they had just seen some weird animal or something you know, that they never walked across the stage before. <laughs> right. So tell me, who's the audience for the book? It's hard. It's interesting because I always wonder how writers struggle with how much to explain and uh, how much to take for granted in terms of knowledge levels. I tried to write the book in a way that would make it accessible to anyone who at least had a high school education. Mm -hmm. and certainly anyone who was in college, community college, anywhere. So there's not there's not a lot of theory. There's no theory. You know, that, there is a little theory in the book, but it's very carefully explained. Um, and it's not the primary way in which the book is written. The book is written as biographies of people. It's people's stories. So it's a book of stories of people's lives. And so I wanted to make the audience as broad as possible. I also wanted to reach the left that was not necessarily gay or lesbian. I wanted to reach the gay and lesbian community because I wanted them to see that there were communists who were very important in helping to found gay liberation. You know, in the, you know, one of my people was a Stonewall veteran, you know, that sort of thing. But I also wanted communists now and, and also just people on the broader left, the socialist movement, like, uh, you know, the, the Socialist Party, um, uh, democratic movements like that, to know and, and to have a different attitude toward gays and lesbians, uh, where they would see us in, as fuller people with um, um, not only yearnings, but insights that they don't have if, if they're straight. There's a different consciousness. And that's what I was, so my audience was that way, you know, pe people who were activists, people who were gay and lesbian, and people who were straight and particularly on the left. Um, that's what I was, that's what I was trying to, trying to reach. And uh, so then the way I handled some things, you know, because this, some of the, some of the stories in the book take case, take place in the thirties and the forties and the fifties. And I'm referring to political cases uh, you know, for example, the Willie McGee case. Willie McGee was a black man who was legally lynched in the South uh, in 1951. And so what I what I do is I have extensive reference notes at the back. So if anybody wants to understand who somebody was or what was this case about, or what is this organization or something like that, they can go into the reference notes and I'm very detailed there. But in the text itself, it just reads as a narrative. I love a the story component and also the research. You know, I go to the footnotes right away when I open the chapter. So I applaud both of those features. Um, four of your chapters focus on individuals: Harry Hay, Elizabeth Betty Boynton Millard, Eleanor Flexner, and Lorraine Hansberry. How did you happen to choose those four figures? So that's an interesting question. I knew I was going to do um, Harry Hay because he's so important to the founding of gay liberation and the founding of the Mattachine Society uh, in 1951 of all times. You know, you think, my gosh, that's when the McCarthy period and, and he, but he was in the Communist Party. And uh, there's a whole story about how he joined the Communist Party <laughs> because uh, he actually got married uh, you know, but anyway, I chose Harry and I also because I had access to his papers. See, that was also important. I had to have enough material to be able to write a full chapter rather than more of a vignette, you know. So I had his papers and then Betty Millard fell into my lap, basically, when um, she passed away in, I think it was 2012. 
I think was when she died. She was like almost 100 years old. She was 99 years old. And when she died, her papers were deposited at Smith College. And I had already been in there for somebody else. And But I, I, I uh, got a call from one of the archivists who was a former student of mine who knew I was doing this work. And her name is Kelly Anderson. And Kelly called me and said, uh, her papers are here if you, if you want Adam. And so, of course, I wanted Adam. So then I had her papers, you see. And then um, as for Flexner, um, Flexner was very, very important to me personally because of her book about women. I taught women's history and her book about women's suffrage. And when I read that book, which was a long, long time ago, first read it, I said, this woman is a Marxist. I mean, I didn't know she was in the Communist Party, but I knew she was a Marxist. And um, and then when I, and I had no idea she was queer, just none. I mean, that wouldn't have even entered my mind when I read that book. But then what happened was I was in the archive of another woman, Bertha Reynolds, who's also in my book, but in a shorter section. And Bertha was corresponding with Eleanor. They were friends. And I noticed in the letters that when she corresponded, she always sent her regards to someone named Helen Terry. And sometimes she wrote to both of them, like Ellen, dear Eleanor and Terry. They called her Terry. They didn't call her Helen. And I thought, who is this? So that's what led me to go check out Eleanor Flexner. And in her oral history and in her papers, it's perfectly obvious that, that she and, and Ellen Terry were lovers. So that's how, but I had the papers there again. So that was very exciting to me and personally important to me. And then uh, Lorraine Hansberry was uh, just, uh, for me, that writing that chapter was uh, the most emotionally powerful for me personally. Uh, I was thrilled to know she was a lesbian. I knew of her, I'd been to see Raisin in the Sun, you know, obviously in terms of my background, but I knew almost all of the black communist intelligentsia that she knew and those that th th those are the people that mentored her. So once I had access to her papers and um, knew that she was, uh, you know, absolutely in the Communist Party, I could I could verify it, and I knew she was uh, a, a lesbian. Um, she just <clears throat> that chapter was just very important to me to write. I loved reading it, and I had read the Amani Perry, yes, by, and I just can't get enough of Lorraine Hansberry. Yes. She's a wonderful figure and inspiring. Um, yes. And Imani, I just want to say Imani Perry's book was very important to me. It, it's a very good book. Uh, Imani Perry is just amazing. She won the National Book Award last year. She, right, she, so. Yeah, absolutely. She's an amazing person. And mm -hmm. I'm very indebted to her <laughs> for that book. Um, but there were some things in there. She, to, to me, she didn't dwell enough on the lesbian. She didn't understand that component of it. And I think she also didn't uh, realize the significance of Hansberry's connection to the Communist Party. And one thing that emerged in from your conversation with Sarah Schulman in an interview, correct me if I'm wrong, you were talking about the Communist Party having a downtown branch and a Harlem branch. <laughs> tell us a little, that's so interesting. Can you tell us a little about yeah. that? Well, the National Office of the Communist Party was uh, uh, on 26th Street, the West 26th Street in New York. And uh, so that was the national office. And <clears throat> and then of course the party had, that's, that's the national leadership. And then in different cities and towns and all over there were clubs uh, and there, would, there was like, a, and then a state organization. So like in California, Northern California, where I spent most of my life, there was the Communist Party of Northern California. And it had its it, its leadership, and likewise in Southern California and so forth. But in New York, in there was a Harlem club of the Communist Party. You know, it was like a hub. I, I don't know if it was actually a club, but there was a hub of black communist intellectuals. Then they were they were featured around uh, the newspaper or news journal published by Paul Robeson, the great black singer who was a communist uh, and who was of course blacklisted and that's a whole other story. But Paul was publishing, Robeson was publishing a, a news journal called Freedom. 
And, uh, <clears throat> and Lorraine Hansberry went to work there. And that was right at the center of this really huge, powerful set section of, of Black communist writers. It included W.E.B. Du Bois, Shirley Graham. Uh, those are people whose names people might know. But it also included Louis Burnham, who was very, very, he was the editor. <clears throat> and uh, so in including these people, it also included a woman named Claudia Jones, who was who was part of this. The artist, um, uh, Elizabeth Catlett, that some people may know, she's getting much more famous now. She died a number of years ago. Uh, the, the artist, Charles White, uh, so, so so it was a cluster of, of remarkable people, um, and I knew almost all of them. And um, so that's that that's kind of uh, why she was such an important uh, chapter for me to write. And one thing that I learned in that chapter was her um, the significance of her insight that I had never thought about that um, the Brown versus Board of Education ruling as a result of that, the backlash about that, Emmett Till was killed. And then as a response possibly to Emmett Till's murder, the Montgomery bus boycott began. And so that that's really a sharp analysis and I'd never thought of it. Well, when she said that she was, by that time she was editor of the, <clears throat> of the newspaper or the, the, the monthly magazine of the Labor Youth League which was basically the Young Communist League at that time. And uh, so that so that's an interesting point to make also. You see, she shifted from an all black environment when uh, freedom folded um, <clears throat> and she became uh, editor of this uh, uh, monthly news magazine for the Labor Youth League. And that was predominantly white. So she turned that magazine into a, a sort of monthly way of educating white people about racism. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And then when Emmett Till was murdered, as you point out, she wrote about that. And she saw it as, uh, uh, I mean, there's specific, there's specific reasons why Emmett Till was lynched that happened, but it didn't surprise her in the sense that she thought there would be a huge backlash of violence in the South as a result of Brown versus the Board of Education. And yes, historians have de de definitely concluded that the Montgomery bus boycott was in response to the murder of Emmett Till. <clears throat> um, can we switch back to Harry Hay yeah. and his theory of LGBT consciousness and how it might foster social change? Sure. So Harry, <clears throat> I just fell in love with Harry. <laughs> and uh, I think, you know, he's very charismatic and anyone who listens to his oral history, which I did uh, with my little earphones on in the New York Public Library that uh, John D'Amelio did with him and Jonathan Katz. Uh, he's a wonderful, wonderful personality, wonderful person. Anyway, uh, Everybody who founded the Mattachine Society, the first Mattachine Society, they were all communists. That that's you know it was like this. <laughs> so and uh, and then there's a story about how they founded it, which is very interesting. How they got enough people to 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 found it, but I'll leave that aside for the moment. But <clears throat> Harry was an erudite Marxist scholar, and as a member of the Communist Party. He was the education director of his party club. And as education director of his party club, he often did educationals that related, first of all, to Black liberation, because the party was very strong in its anti-racist commitments and in its uh, theories of the special oppression of Black people. Let's put it that way. That was, that was the language that would be used. Um, and... Um, <clears throat> As a, as a result of enslavement and and um, um, the, the the impoverishment of of African Americans, so he was very familiar with that, and he was also a teacher <clears throat> at the California Labor School, and when he that that was also a party run 
Marxist school. It had branches in both Southern California and Northern California. And his class was um, on music. He was like a musicologist. And he taught a class on how um, music, through folk music, through popular music, you could trace the class consciousness of people. So you see, he thought a lot about consciousness, about class consciousness, about anti-racist consciousness and so forth. And he had this idea that because uh, um, queer people, uh, they, you know, they didn't use the whole LGBT then, you know, but they didn't even use queer, it would have been gay and lesbian people, were, he used the language culturally oppressed minority which you see is parallel to the idea of black people as a nationally oppressed minority. You, you see the, 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 straight, the stream there of consciousness. And so just as black people have a particular consciousness of racism, and just as working class people have a particular consciousness of class, and right, because of our experience, our consciousness is formed by our experience. His point was that gay and lesbian people had a revolutionary potential as a consciousness of a culturally oppressed minority. And um, he, he saw it as a revolutionary potential. And that's what he wanted the Mattachine Society to, to organize and to coalesce. And uh, it's not what happened, but it was what his vision was. Well, this has been very diverting. We could talk um, for a long time, but Let's pause, and I've asked you to prepare a reading. So let's give the audience a taste of the book. Okay, so I'll prepare. I did a, a little preparation here, and this is from the beginning of the book. And I appreciate the opportunity to to read a little book, a little bit from it. Um, <clears throat> this is like the first paragraph. I came out of the closet with confidence in 1965 as a communist. I had been a prominent leader in the free speech movement on the University of California Berkeley campus the previous year. Now I was running at a student-wide election for a position on the rules committee that would govern free speech on campus. I thought the students should know my political affiliation, which at the time was still only semi-legal. I wrote an open letter to the students on the Berkeley campus of the University of California, and it was published on the front page of the Daily Cal. I was 21. The next day, a headline on the front page of the San Francisco Examiner read, Bettina admits it, she's a red. I won the election in a landslide. I don't remember feeling particularly fearful about my communist coming out. This was because it was emotionally congruent with my family and friends. I did get a lot of mail, some of it viciously misogynist and anti-Semitic. There were also death threats, more some, some more serious than others. I lost my auto insurance because the company now considered me a target person. <clears throat> I also got hundreds and hundreds of letters of support, some of which were deeply moving to me. And then a few pages later, I make the point, of course, that the Communist Party had banned gays and lesbians for membership already. I came out as a lesbian 10 years after Stonewall. It was November 7th, 1979. I had fallen in love with a woman and I was soaring with happiness. I was also sometimes stricken with absolute terror. My sweetheart had no such terrors. Kate was thrilled to claim a lesbian identity and called up all manner of friends from her adolescence and young adulthood to proclaim it. They may have been more than a little startled, but most of them were supportive, swept up by her affirming enthusiasm. Born and raised in North Dakota in a working class family whose parents were Republicans and devout members of a Lutheran church, she had somehow escaped all of the intense and damning homophobia that I had absorbed in and around the communist left. This might say something about what the word radical means. It is also striking that Kate did not internalize homophobia while I was saturated with it. The process of unlearning the deep layering of it in my consciousness remains ongoing even after all these years. I kept my lesbian identity a secret from my parents for years and drove Kate crazy with my endless speculations about whether or not my mother knew. 
Really, in retrospect, it was ridiculous. But at the time, I was on an emotional cliff, alternating between ecstasy and paranoia. Finally, I talked to my mother, and she told me that she had known I was a lesbian since I was 16. And when I shrieked, why didn't she tell me? She said, because I hoped for the best. The best, from her point of view, was marriage and children. So that, and then I go on to talk about Lillian Wald, but we already talked about her. So that's oh. about sir, from the opening of the book. <clears throat> that's great. And the book is dedicated to your partner, Kate. Yes, it is. You've been involved for a long time now. Yes. She's put up with me. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's talk. You have little vignettes uh, that aren't chapter length of a couple of people. Would you mind telling us a little about David Du Bois? Very so, interesting figure. Yes. So I, uh, David, is, his full name was David Graham Du Bois. And he was the son of Shirley Graham who in later life married W.E.B. Du Bois. At the time of their marriage, he was, uh, I, I don't know, this, she was about 50, 58 years old and he was about 40 years older. So um, when they married, David took on the Du Bois name and was very proud to be, uh, associated with W.E.B. Du Bois. Um, <clears throat> he lived most of his life, uh, his adult life in Cairo, Egypt. He was a radio journalist. Um, the way I knew him was that my parents, especially my father, was very close to W.E.B. Du Bois. And for those who may know, not know, my dad was a uh, um, um, a historian, ma mainly of African American history, and he and Du Bois were very close. Um, and so the Du Boises, Shirley Graham and W. E. B. Du Bois, were frequent visitors to our home, or we visited them at their home. And I grew up knowing them. I basically knew them my whole life. And David, uh, when I was still um, quite young, uh, was still living in the United States. Uh, following their marriage in the, in the 50s. And he came and he would visit me. But well, really, he was visiting my parents. But he would visit with me. And so he was like an older brother to me, very much older, you know, considerably older. But but he we, we had that kind of, of relationship. And I just adored him. And, uh, and then at various times, he would take me on excursions, just me and him together. And uh, those excursions uh, sometimes ended up at the Brooklyn Museum and had a very extensive collection of um, artifacts and art and so forth from Africa. And he, he delighted in, in teaching me about that. So that was our relationship. And then, as I said, he moved to Cairo and he was there for uh, all of most of his life. Uh, in 1973, he came back to the United States to edit the Black Panther newspaper. And that was because of the terrible, so that was in Oakland, and because of the terrible repression uh, against the uh, Black Panther Party, most of their leadership was in prison at that point. So uh, <clears throat> I hadn't seen him in years. And uh, in 1987, I was in Amherst, University of Massachusetts in Amherst, and David was spending six months in Cairo at that point, and six months in Amherst, he was teaching at the University of Massachusetts uh, in the journalism and African-American studies departments. But he was also there in order to make sure that the papers of Dr. Du Bois were properly assembled and properly placed in the um, in the in the library, in the Af in in the in the library at University of Massachusetts at Amherst. My father had been very involved in that also. So in 1987, um, <clears throat> I was visiting Amherst because I was involved in another project uh, with, with colleagues uh, in African-American studies. And um, unbeknownst to me, um, they arranged for David uh, and I to have a reunion. And so that's, that's in the book and that's how that chapter starts. And uh, we fell into each other's arms 
and we were crying and we were laughing at the same time, you know, as you do when you love someone and you haven't seen them in a long time. And when we finally separated and just looked at each other, you know, sort of holding each other by the shoulders, you know, and how you look at somebody, he said, you know, I'm gay. And I had no idea, of course, although it made perfect sense then and a lot of things fell into place. And uh, then he talked about his life in Cairo and uh, the work that he was doing and asked about me and, and so on. So <clears throat> that was a very important moment for me. And um, <clears throat> to know that this <clears throat> remarkable man was gay and how closeted he was. And um, so that's what I write about in, in, in the chapter. And it's, it's short. It's not, it's, it's just a vignette. Uh, because there's no papers. I have no access to anything. Uh, there's no personal papers. There's, no, there's nothing I could uh, grab onto there. So I had to rely upon my personal experience and my conversations with him. And of course, subsequently to 87, I saw him quite frequently until his death. And I spoke, I was, I was called by uh, the head of African-American studies at that time, a man named John Bracey called me to let me know that David had died. I was very shocked. I, I had just sent David an email telling him I was coming to Amherst. I had no idea he was ill. And, um, and, and, and John asked me if I would come and speak at his memorial service, which I did. Well, that's really a moving story. And one thing I like about the book is that you bring all these historical figures to life by spotlighting their significant others, their wives, their children, and you grew up with all of them. I mean, one thing we haven't, we didn't mention at the outset, I'm glad you mentioned your father now, is that he was a huge historical figure. I mean, I when I was at Barnard, I read his work. Yes. And to follow, and you followed in his footsteps, because let me just say something about you. Um, when I was a graduate student at University of Wisconsin-Madison, I took a class called Women, Race, and Class after Angela Davis's book. And your book, Women's Legacy, was assigned. So yeah. it's a very illustrious intellectual family. Thank you. Thank well, you. Well, it's the truth. <laughs> Let's talk about the Berkshire Conference of 1978 and how it uh, its significance in your life and development. So uh, people may know the Berkshire Conference is sort of the uh, very important meeting of women, women, people doing women's history, let's put it that way. Now it's also women and gender history. They, they've updated it. Um, and uh, this conference was, uh, I think it was at Mount Holyoke, if I'm remembering right. I haven't looked at that little section yet, but I think it was at Mount Holyoke. And... Um, um, I was struggling to come out. This is 1978. See, I hadn't met Kate yet. I mean, I knew Kate, but I, we weren't lovers yet. And uh, so I was struggling with my identity and so forth. And um, I was giving a paper at this conference and um, there was a panel that had been put together by the great Audrey Lord. And the panel, uh, you know, we all read her, know her work and so forth. The, the panel was, um, originally scheduled by the Berkshire Program Committee for a small room, and they took the word lesbian out of the title. Lesbian had been in the title. And it, it was a panel on, on lesbian literature, basically, you see. And they took the word lesbian out of the title. So you don't do that to Audrey Lord, you know? You just don't do that. So Audrey organized, and they put out a flyer, and they announced this panel, and they put the word lesbian back. <laughs> And um, the, and then it was it had to be held in the largest auditorium that Mount Holyoke had. Okay, so of course I went. I was thrilled, and I'm sitting there, you know, in my little seat. And uh, Aunt Audrey read the Eroticus Power. That was the paper that she gave there, which had tremendous impact on me. To think of the Eroticus Power and the way she was writing about it, and and so on. <clears throat> After that panel was over, somebody stood up and gave an account of what I just said, of how the program committee had tried to uh, obscure this panel and take and so on. And, so on. 
And then that person asked if all the lesbians in the room would stand up. And the almost, there were 2,000 people in that room and almost the entire room stood up. But I was frozen in my seat, terrified of coming out. But I looked around and I thought, all of these women are not lesbians. They, they can't be. I know they're not. You know, and I had the I had the moment of of insight where I thought those of us who really are lesbians are still sitting because we're not out and we're too afraid to stand up. <laughs> this is a tremendous moment of consciousness for me. Uh, I never did stand up, but I remember then Audrey stood up afterwards and she said, "The first thing a minority must do is make itself visible to itself." And I knew that. I knew that from. All my work, all my work in solidarity with and as an ally of African American people, all my work, uh, you know, in the in the communist left, uh, I was still in the communist party at that point. I knew all of that, and of course you have to make yourself visible, otherwise nobody knows you're there. And uh, so that was a tremendous moment for me, and I'm very indebted, of course, to Audrey Lord, and to all the all the women who stood who stood in solidarity at that at that conference. So that was earth shaking for me. And it, it helped me a great deal. You know, I remember some of those conferences in the late 70s and early 80s, they were electrifying. Yeah. yeah. So much energy in the room and it was so exciting. Yes, this is exactly right. Um, believe it or not, we're getting, we want to leave time for a couple of more questions. Um, one concern, well, let me just, um, ask you about your current projects. This has been a wonderful um, book, and I imagine you're doing a uh, book tour. And, well, one more question. What has the reception been? I know you've been going around giving talks. Anything surprise you? or The reception has been wonderful, and I've just been having a ball with it. I did, That's all I can say. As Sarah Shulman, absolutely, she's, I mean, she's just, you know, I love the woman. She's just phenomenal. And she she was so helpful when I was finishing up the book and and so praise praising of it, gave me so much confidence. And then she asked, she said, can we do a couple of programs together? And I said, yeah, I'd be very honored to do program with you. So we ended up, I was on her schedule, you know, whenever she was available, we ended up doing two programs in New York in April of this year. And the reception was wonderful. And when we were at CLAGS, that's the Center for Lesbian and Gay Studies at, at CUNY, CUNY Graduate Center, we had a huge audience. It had originally been uh, sold out and then they opened up another room. So we had quite a lot of people there. And many of them were red diaper babies, right? Which means that they came from communist families. Some were queer, some weren't. Some were my former students. Uh, Marty Duberman was there, who was, you know, he's 90. I'd never met the man, but I'd read his work. That was, it was fabulous. You know, Charlotte Bunch was there. I mean, it, it was the most wonderful evening. And then the, these most amazing people. And then Sarah gave, you know, asked wonderful questions. And we had, I think, a quite, a quite good dialogue. And people, it was just, to me, it was just a hoot and a half because it was just so much fun. And, and there were people there whose parents had been in the Communist Party. And who were themselves lesbians, and and I mean, so they shared a lot of stuff. So that was one reception that was especially, especially outstanding. I have to say, Blanche Wise and Cook was there that night with, uh, with her her lover, the wonderful playwright Claire Koss. So it was a marvelous evening. But that's how it's been. Uh, I did talk at NYU. I did another one at Hamilton College. I was up in Rochester, New York, uh, at the LGBT Center in Rochester, New York. And everywhere I've gone, it, it has been, a well, no matter the size of the audience, sometimes large, sometimes smaller, it doesn't matter. It's been a wonderful reception to the book. And then there's very nice, there's been some nice reviews, um, including in the Gay and Lesbian Review uh, magazine, there was a very nice review in there. And there've been some others, and I expect one to come out any day now in Lesbian Studies. There's a journal of Lesbian Studies, and there's going to be a review in there. So I've been uh, very gratified by the reception, uh, including at bookstores. And there's another, uh, another, and this is fun. So every year in San Francisco, 
there's an annual Howard Zinn literary fair, right? <laughs> and so this year, the, the Harry Bridges Communist Party Club of San Francisco <laughs> will have a table <clears throat> at the Howard Zinn fair, and they will have a panel about my book. Wow. And that will be so much fun. That's all I can say. And I'm going to be in dialogue with one of the fellows who's queer and is in that club, came to a talk I did in San Francisco. So it's just been a, a, a wonderful, a wonderful journey. Well, let me tell the audience that some of this material is online. I was able to zoom into the Clags talk and it's available if you go to YouTube and Google you. I mean, you have an illustrious past history of talks and lectures, but, you know, we can join in after the fact. And you're right. I could, could just feel it, even though I was online, the presence at Clags that night. I also wanted to say that I did it. And it's also online on C-SPAN, if people are interested. I did a, <clears throat> I did a presentation for the California Historical Society. And uh, I was in dialogue there with uh, the, the esteemed scholar Estelle Friedman. Oh, I love her work. And so you can find that, just go to C-SPAN and you can find that also. Um, I think that was in January uh, of 2023. What are your current projects besides going around promoting? <laughs> well, I have a couple of different things that I'm uh, working on. Uh, one is, uh, <clears throat> this is just an amazing experience I've had. I did an online class through the, platform that's called Coursera through my university. And uh, it's on feminine, it's the title of the class is four lectures on feminism and social justice. And, uh, <clears throat> and as of uh, it, it, they launched it on International Women's Day in 2019. And as of Monday, oh, we had 100, 110,500 students. Oh we're taking this class and uh it's global uh people from all over the world um i just had an i just had a message from a woman from istanbul who just took the class i'm in conversation with a woman in uh chittagore india who's a professor of sociology uh who asked me to do some lectures for them um so it's been and, and people literally all over the world latin america every continent literally every continent um so it's been an extraordinary experience and i've been collating the comments that i've gotten from people the letters i've gotten from people and also people's experiences where they talk about what their definition of feminism is or what the issues are that are facing women so many of them are around domestic violence and and, and more generally violence against women um i had an incredible um exchange with a woman in Tehran, Iran, uh, before the recent uprising, who was trying to write a paper, was writing a paper about the uh, hijab and uh, um, asked me to read it, which I did. She translated it for me into English and I read it. And so it like that. So I'm definitely going to write something. I wanted to write about that experience uh, just to, to open up this incredible global feminist passion that's out there so that was that was one that was one project and the other project that i'm is a byproduct of my memoir intimate politics that you referred to in which um i was asked by a colleague at nyu uh for whom i've done lectures already on sexual um on incest and and sexual uh, assault on children and child sexual abuse to write something and I've agreed to write that. So I have some projects like that and and then some journal articles that people have asked me to write. I don't think I'm going to do another book. I don't think I have it in me at my age um, to start another major project, but I think I do have it in me to do public talks and to uh, be allied to various struggles that are going on and to write shorter pieces like these. Well, you have seven books, nine, including two you wrote with your father. So that's a pretty good yeah, legacy. I think, it's, I think it's eight books altogether. And, um, eight books. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. Not too shabby. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, 
Um, I'd love to have you come on again because I feel like we've just begun to um, talk about things. And what I liked about our conversation was they all, you know, each comment led down other paths. Um, and, but we still have time for you to share last words with our audience. Well, my last words are, uh, I guess what I wanna say is, um, we're in a very difficult period right now of uh, tremendous, uh, I'm calling it a fascist movement that has taken over a, 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 a significant section of the Republican party and uh, is doing very great damage uh, and especially to gay and lesbian rights and to transgender people. They're, they're sort of like the whipping post. They've been like the whipping post of this fascist front that's coming in. You can see it in uh, Florida, of course, with DeSantis. But you can see it with Greg Abbott in, uh, in, in Texas, but all over the country, especially in the Midwest and so on. And there's resistance. Everywhere there's resistance. But at the same time, you have this uh, fascist front and uh, I think it's very, very important for us in the gay and lesbian community uh, to stand in solidarity with each other, to take on, you know, and, and support the very courageous people that are standing up uh, in the libraries, the librarians and the teachers that are being fired or smeared or terrorized, really, demonized and terrorized by, by people. And... Um, and then the escalation in racism and the and in the at the border and immigration, these issues are all related. And of course, the terrible assault on reproductive rights for women um, is just horrific. So these are all connected to each other the way I the way I see it. And I think that uh, as as a progressive and radical gay and lesbian people, uh, transgender people, we do everything in our power to unite with each other and to unite with others uh, in order to make a counter movement uh, to defeat this uh, fascist upsurge. It's a backlash. It's a backlash against what was what has been accomplished. And they're trying to put us back. And we have to resist with everything we have. I agree. And as your colleague Angela Davis says, of course, you have to hope. What else is there? Right. So, you do um, whatever you can. You, you stay in there and you do whatever you can. Bettina Apthaker, thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining us. And until next time, remember, resist. <laughs>